It's uh, almost, it's like a, it's truly a homecoming when you get to see friends and family that you've not seen in quite a few days, quite a few weeks, quite a few years. I was telling Pastor Carl a little while ago, I said, this is so popular, let's do it next week. <laughs> but I was thinking the meaning of homecoming. You know, church, one day there's going to be a homecoming. One day we'll all be together. When all God's children get to heaven, what a time, what a time, what a time that's going to be. Amen. But until then, we're going to worship and praise the Lord and lift Him up and give Him praise and giving Him thanks in this house this morning. We're going to do a little congregational song. Get out and shake somebody's hand and hug their neck and tell them it's good to see them in homecoming today. Amen. Well, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. Oh, now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Well, praise the Lord, I saw the light, oh, I saw the light, I saw the light, no more in darkness, no more in night. filled with sin I wouldn't let my dear Savior in then Jesus came like a stranger in the night well praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light no more in darkness no more in night now I'm so happy no sorrow inside well praise the Lord Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then like that blind man that God gave back his sight. Well, praise the Lord, I saw the light. Saturate this air with praise unto your God, because there ain't nobody, nobody, do you like Jesus, amen? It's so good to see everybody this morning, it's so good, it's uh, good to have the, uh, the, I know Brother Jim and Ruby Lee, uh, they were uh, the first ministers of Words of Life Tabernacle, started back in 1958, and uh, we're thankful for them, got to know them. Uh, Sister Ruby Lee called me her boyfriend. I thought that was a big deal. Until a guy got in a room with a lot of people, and she had a lot of boyfriends. 
And all along, I'd see Brother Jim Lee over in the corner smiling because he knew who the real boyfriend was. I can't remember how many years they were married, but I know it's more than four. How many? 68. Hallelujah. Woo, 68. There's hope for you, baby. We're on, we're on 26. And I want my name in the paper or something. I don't know. But God is so good, and I'm so glad that everybody's here. I want you just to don't get in a hurry today. If somebody's here and you say, why is there so many people here? We're having homecoming. We've invited other people to come, other family that goes to other churches, but it's good that God's people can come together and worship and praise Him. Amen? Because heaven is not going to be roped off. Amen? We're all going to be worshiping Him together in one mind and one accord, and what a great day that will be. Girls, if you would come on up. Sister Linda, Sister... Uh, Sheila and Sister Lin uh, Pam. Boy, I didn't get. I don't say sister in front of all that names. But put your hands together as the Lee girls come. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. Now he tells me I'm on. You can sit down if you'd like. I am Linda. I am the eldest of the sisters, and that's why he could remember my name. I'm so old. Uh, we, uh, we are glad to be here, glad that you invited us to come. I'd like to do one little exercise here. Since my father was the first pastor of Words of Life Tabernacle, those of you who were actually here, going to church here when he was pastor, would you please stand up or raise your hand if you can't stand up? Stand up. It's good to see all of you again. Uh, when Daddy first started pastoring this church, we lived over in Fairview. That's a good ways away. And so on Wednesday night and Sunday night when we would leave the church, I'd get real steady and I would get real sleepy. Pam and Sheila weren't even born at that time. And so we'd crawl in the back seat and we'd go to sleep. And um, when we got home, Daddy would wake Eddie up, make him walk in. But guess what he did to me? He picked me up in his arms and carried me in the house. I remember that just as plain as it was yesterday because we were going home and his arms were taking me there. This first song is, We're Going Home. Many times in my childhood when we travel so far by night, oh, how weary. I'd grow. Father's arms would slip round me so gently he'd say, my child, we're going home. Go Praise God, I'm going. 
so heavy and I'm longing to see all my loved ones and friends I have known. Every step draws me nearer to the land of my dreams. Praise God, I'm going home. Yes, I'm going home. Yes, I'm going home. There's nothing to hold me here. For I saw a glimpse of that heavenly land. Praise God, I'm going home. I think it'll be long before we get to go home. Y'all are going to have to pray for me today. <laughs> I just, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't sing and cry at the same time. <laughs> but it's so good to be here. Paula, we, we practiced here Thursday night, and Paula led us into the old building, and I think that's maybe, I, maybe the second time I've been there since I was 14 years old. <laughs> um, but I am so thankful for my parents and, and my heritage. I'm thankful for the word of God that my dad preached and the way he lived it at home every day. And I'm thankful for Carl because I know he does the same thing. I know he's been a great pastor to you. So please forgive me if I cry and then my voice goes wonky and <laughs> it sounds awful, but <laughs> I am thankful to the Lord to be here today and to be saved most of all. And uh, we just pray that however it sounds <laughs> to the ear that it'll be a, a joy to your heart. Jesus, my life was empty and vain, and nothing ahead could I see but sorrow and pain. But then at an altar one night I knelt, and I found assurance that never has left. For Jesus was right for what was wrong in my life. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Just give him a chance and Jesus will prove that every promise he made is true. For Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word. Open your Bible and read to God's voice you've heard. And then at an altar in repentance kneel, and you'll find assurance that you'll know is real. For Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Whatever's wrong in your life, just give him a chance and Jesus. 
Jesus will prove that every promise he made is true. For Jesus is right for whatever's wrong in your life. Just give him a chance and Jesus will prove that every promise he made is true. For Jesus is right for whatever's wrong. we heard last night we had homecoming at our church last Sunday and and our visiting minister preached on this uh, part of this where the disciples were tossed on the sea and and Jesus asked them why were you so afraid where's your faith you know we live in troubled times and I never thought I would live to see our country in the mess that it's in But I'm not afraid. I wasn't afraid through COVID. I'm not afraid of what's to come because I know where I'm going. (laughs) And I know how I'm going to get there. This one says there's a man in here. There's a man in here who turns water to wine and he Walks on the water and gives sight to the blind And he gives back life to the ones that's dead And he fed four thousand with seven loaves of bread There's a man in here who makes demons flee And makes cripples walk and he's chosen even me But he lives in my heart and I have no fear I'm a better child there's a man in here there's a man in here that i'm looking for cried the man who could find 
no room at the door, so they lowered him down on a stretcher bed, and Jesus looked at him and said, all your sins are all now gone this day, take up your bed and go your way, as he walked through the crowd, they heard him declare, I can tell you all that there's a man in there, there's a man in here who turns water to wine, and he walks on the water and gives sight to the blind, and he gives back life to the once that's dead and he fed four thousand with seven loaves of bread there's a man in here who makes demons flee who makes cripples walk and he's chosen even me and he lives in my heart and i have no fear i'm a better child there's a man in here cried as the ship was tossed from side to side so they woke him up as the waves grew high and said don't you care that we're about to die and he said peace be still and when the waves had laid he said where's your faith why were you so afraid when they saw that the sea was smooth and clear they said thank you god there's a man in here there's a man in here who turns water to wine and he walks on the water and gives sight to the blind and he gives back life to the once that's dead and he fed four thousand with seven loaves of bread there's a man in here who makes demons flee who makes cripples walk and he's chosen even me and he lives in my heart and i have no fear i'm a better child cause there's a man in here i'm a better child cause there's a man in here spirit i cry lord lift me up i want to go higher with thee but the lord knows i can't live on the mountain and so he picks out a valley
tried, but in the valley he restoreth my soul. Oh yes, he draws me aside to be tested and tried, but in the valley. about three more for you and please pray that I get through these. <laughs> these are very special to us. This next one, uh, if you knew us as when we sang before with mom, we were called the Lower Lights Trio and mama picked the name of the group because she read uh, a story or heard a story about how this song, Let the Lower Lights Be Burning, was written and um, it talks about how uh, there were the lighthouse on the shore was burning bright, but the lights along the shore had gone out. And because there were no lights to show the ship's captains where the rocks were, many ships went down. And she always said, I can't be the lighthouse shining bright, but I can always be one of the little lights along the shore. Um, so please pray that I get through this one without crying. <laughs> but I hope it's a blessing. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his light house evermore, but to us he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Our responsibility to so trim your feeble lamps, my brother. Some poor sailor, tempest tossed, trying now to breach the So let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam, a gleam across the waves, some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue. This next song was one of Daddy's favorites. 
Um, if you remember, he had a radio broadcast called The Call to Calvary. And uh, this was one of his favorite songs. And if you listen to the words and you think about what Christ really went through, um, just from, from his father turning his back on him, we have no idea what that meant to him, how hard that was for him, because he'd always been with God the Father. And for, God couldn't even look at him because he had your sin and he had my sin Amen. on him. And when you think about all the torture that he went through, it's, it's amazing that he actually made it to the cross through all the torture that they did to him. But because of that, we have the opportunity to go to heaven. And we should not take that lightly, not at all. So this song says, after Calvary, I'll do anything because of what you did for me at Calvary. She's not on. You're not on. It wasn't. It's home. Test, test, test. Uh -huh. What'd you do to it? <laughs> <laughs> There's no telling. <laughs> Take my hand and lead me through the darkest valley at your command. I would move across the sea, across the sea. Lord, take my hand and guide me wherever you'd have me to be. Lord, I'll do anything after Calvary. Unashamed before this world, I'll live for thee, just for thee. Just take my life and mold me the way you'd have me to be, Lord. I Shed your blood so free. Lord, I'll do anything, anything that you would have me to do after what you did for me at Calvary. Just take my life and mold me the way you'd have me to be. Lord, I'll do anything. After Calvary, after what you did for me at Calvary. You know, we're always using uh, social media these days. And so I want you to go on to um, Facebook, type in Christ's Crucifixion Explained. And a doctor, a medical doctor, will come on there and explain to you exactly what kind of physical pain and agony he went through. And every night when I 
when I pray. At the end of my prayer, I always say, thank you, Jesus, for being my sacrifice. And I fail to find the words to say how much I appreciate it. I mean, what can I say? You know, yeah. amazing is not enough. Anyway, use your media for something, social media for something good. Go look that up. <laughs> Before we do this last one, I'd like to say, this is only the third time we've sung together in 40 years. Yeah, four, no, in six years. Six years. You said 40 years. Well, <laughs> we, we sang together for 40 years. But we stood, we stood here and sang at Mother's funeral, and we sang up at the Cove one night, and this is the third time since, since Mother passed that, that we've sung together. Uh, so you really took a chance <laughs> on having us, but we appreciate it so much. And we have so many good memories of all the folks here and the good times that we had. And uh, this next song says, A Thousand Years or More. One of these days, we won't have to part anymore. Amen. Amen. We'll be together forever. I'm looking forward to that day. <clears throat> we'll leave you with this one, A Thousand Years or More. A thousand years. Ten thousand years, a million years or more, I'll look upon the crystal sea and walk along the shore. And when mine eyes have drunk their of all the beauties rare I'll join the throng that marches on that hallelujah square and as we march in unison we'll sing redemption song that earthly grave is empty now and victory is won our hearts will never break again our tears will all be your a thousand years, ten thousand years, a million years or more. Our hearts will never break again, our tears will all be years, ten thousand years, a million years, or more. I'd like to say one more thing before we sit down. Many of you have asked where Eddie is. Eddie is up in Ohio visiting his uh, youngest daughter, but he couldn't have been here anyway as far as singing is concerned. Really pray for him. He can hardly talk about 15 minutes without his voice going away. So pray for him. And as you can see, the older we get, the worse it gets. <laughs> so not just pray for him, pray for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, just, I'm sure preacher Lee would be happy. He'd be pleased. If you did it, you didn't have to do it, you'd got to do it. And I'm just, uh, you know, I always stand and believe, you know, preacher Lee stood for what was the truth whenever it wasn't popular. And he didn't compromise even if it made you mad. And uh, uh, I may have, may have got a little of that from him. So, you know, I'm going to preach the truth even if it makes you mad. So, uh, 
because uh, you know you got the same shoes to get glad in, you got mad in. So we're just uh, uh, we're just glad that we're glad for the leaves and uh, I'll, Amen. I'm glad to have had a pastor when I was a kid growing up that uh, stayed true until he breathed his last breath. He stayed true to the love of God and the call of God. And, you know, some people start out, and they quit in the middle. And uh, I wonder if they're really called. So, uh, but the preacher Lee was always a blessing to me wherever we went. We went to Mexico, and we, uh, we had a good time, and uh, we had a real good time. <laughs> So, but uh, we worked, and we worked like, you know, we worked like dogs, but we had the best time, and we just, I wouldn't take nothing for it, and uh, we just, uh, I'm glad to have homecoming, so, you know, I'm glad we got food in the neck back, but I'm going to preach to your hide for a few minutes, and uh, we're going to let God have his way. So, if you got your Bible this morning, then uh, I want you to turn with me to Second Samuel chapter 9, and most of you will know the story about Mephibosheth, and... Uh, I just thank God, you know, that no matter where you're at in life, God knows exactly where you're at. No matter how far you fell, no matter, you know, how, how far you've went, you know, you may have been trying to outrun your heritage, you may be try, trying to run the way you was raised, and a lot of people try to get away from that. And, uh, you know, the thing, good thing about God is, you know, as a child, you know, you're, there's a seed planted in your heart, and uh, you can run, but you can't hide. And... Uh, a lot of us has tried that down through time. We run from the things of God. We run from, we run from church. We run from God. We run from everything. We tried to hide. But you know, as a kid, as a parent, put, put something in you, and they brought you to church when you didn't want to come. And they brought you to Sunday school. They brought you to Sunday morning church, Sunday night church, Wednesday night church. And all the time, you was, you know, you didn't, you, sometimes you just, you went, you weren't willing, but, you know, Mom always had a way of making you willing to go, so, uh, so we know, we all understand that, but the thing is, you know, the, the, all the time they were instilling something in your heart, so no matter where you went, no matter what happened in life, you know, there was something in there that would call you home, and uh, I thank God, you know, that uh, there come a time that God called me home, called me out of the places I was at, and he came looking for me, so this morning, you know, I just want you to think about that this morning. Because the king came looking for you one day. He came looking for you and he found you. He knew exactly where you was and it didn't, it didn't scare him a bit. It didn't matter to him where you was at. He knew exactly where you was and he was still, you're still God's kid. You're still a king's kid. And I just thank God this morning, you know, when David, we see David's life as it unfolds and he becomes king. And he becomes king and all the time, you know, he was... He had, he had a right to do anything he wanted to do, and he could go anywhere he wanted to do, and he, he ruled, and whatever he said went. And the thing is, down through history, if you study history, you'll find how, you know, when a king took place and he took heir to the throne, he tried to kill all the descendants of the, the people that was before him so there would be no threat to the throne. And the thing is, you know, David was different from that because he knew that God had put him on the throne and, you know, a lot of churches nowadays, they have the big churches, they won't allow the preachers inside the church to preach because they're afraid that they want the job. You know, this is not a job, it's a calling. So, uh, you know, if you want to preach here, if you're living right, I'll let you preach. I'm not concerned about where I'm going to be because I know where God put me. So we can, we can rest assured tonight it's not a competition, it's a calling. And we need, to be, we need to answer that call, we need to stand in that call, we need to walk in that calling wherever it is because God knows where you're at. So we... We understand this morning that David had a heart to, to please God, and his, his Word of God says that, but he, he, he ruled different than most kings because he had a tender heart toward God. And uh, I tell you, unless you love people, you can't pastor. Unless you love people, you can, you'll never do what God calls you to do. It won't be a hardship, and you, and you won't find yourself gri- griping about it. You'll just do it, and you'll, and you'll, you'll smile while you're doing it, even sometimes if you're uh, I told somebody the other night, I told Sister Janice, I said, God let Linda live so she could give me a list of stuff to do. So I just, uh, uh, I was out there on the ladder fixing the swing set, and, uh, you know, because, you know, the children is important to her, and uh, she would make, make sure all the swings were safe and all that stuff, and uh, I, I, I just do it because I can do it. One thing is, I can do it, and another thing is, you know, she, she makes me willing to do it, so I just, uh, uh you know, no, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So the thing is, we just got to keep mama happy. Amen. So you've got your Bible. I want to read to you those minutes, and I want to preach to you if you can. And uh, the food won't get no colder than 30 minutes. It will in an hour and 30 minutes. So we'll just don't worry about it. So 
Second uh, Samuel chapter 9, and I do read out of the King James Version most of the time. And it said, And David said, Is there yet any left that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of, of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called unto him, David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, The servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto, he, unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son who is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? Whew. See, God don't care. He don't care what's wrong with you. He don't care where your struggle is. You may be lame in your feet, but it doesn't matter to God. And that just spoke to my spirit. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machar, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. And, the, and then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machar, and the son of Amiel, and wanted to do all that, for Lodibar, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come to David, he fell on his feet, face, and did reverence, and David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy, what is thy servant thou, thou, thou should, shouldest thou look upon, look upon such a dead dog as I? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy father's house, thy master's house, all that pertain to Saul and to all this house. Thou therefore thy sons and thy servants till, till the, shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring forth, bring, shall bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread at my table. Amen. So let's just talk about this for a minute, and we'll let you go eat. And uh, We'll, eat, we'll sit down at the table and eat. So, with, you know, the thing is, you think about how Mephibosheth, they had hid Mephibosheth down in Lodabar because of, because of the heritage, because of the lineage that he was, because he was of the former king's grandson. So they had hid him, per se, down in Lodabar because, you know, the most, like I said earlier, we, we, we see where the king the, will search, search these people out and they will kill the lineage that was before them. You think about the life whenever... You think about the FBI or whatever coming to get you to arrest you or do whatever, and you think about how you would be trying to hide, and I believe this is what happened to Mephibosheth. I think word got out that the, the king was coming for him. He didn't know what he was coming for. He didn't know why he was coming. He just knew that you know, he couldn't run. And the thing is, if you're lame in your feet, you can't run. And I promise you that, you know, that there comes a time in your life you get tired of running. Amen? And you're, you're, just, you're just through of running. You're tired of running. And Mephibosheth was in a place. Can you see the, can you, can you just picture with me this morning how he must have felt when he felt, heard the knock on the door. And, you know, he had the, the king's, uh, the king's servants was there. I don't know how many went. I don't know if there's a whole battalion of soldiers that went to find this kid. And, uh, but the thing is, and whenever the knock on the Lord, don't you know, he knew he couldn't run. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't resist, but he went, he went willingly. And I'm telling you, there comes a time you think about how that Mephibosheth was so, felt so helpless. And, and I'll take you back to a time whenever you gave your heart to God. Whenever you surrendered, truly, truly surrendered your heart to God, you felt helpless. You felt, you felt like the, you was tired of running. It was over. And you just wanted something good, something different in your life. Amen. You wanted something more out of life. You know, and the thing is, we get to a place, everybody gets to that place that you're just just tired. Amen. You get tired of running from what you know. Amen. And you know, he that knoweth doeth good and doeth not to him it's sin. And the thing is, some of us as we, we grew up and we got out of church, we got into the things of the world and we got, got caught up in the things of this world and we run for dear life to get away from what we knew was right. We just uh, tried to outrun the things of God. We run, we run, we run. We try to hide it. We, we, a lot of people try to hide it with drugs. They try to try with all kind of illicit lifestyle. They try to hide it with jobs. They do everything in the world. They try to hide, and they try to get away from that call of God that's in their life. They try to hide from it. You think about how people, the people, there's just no satisfaction in running. 
You can, you can run, but you can't hide. And Mephibosheth could not run. He had hid in Lodabar. And the thing is, Lodabar means a dry desert place. He was in a place where he couldn't prosper. He was in a place where he couldn't get, do no different. Uh, you know, you could, there was no, he was in the ghetto. He was hiding in the ghetto because, you know, to hide in the ghetto is better than, than being dead in the street. Amen. And so he was, he was hiding from what, yeah, because he was running for his life and the thing he was hiding. And there was no prosperity there. There was no, there was no blessings there. The grass couldn't grow. The sheep couldn't, couldn't graze. It was just a place of, of desert. It was a desert place. And nothing was, you know, nothing could suffice in this place. And I promise you, we've all been to that place some, sometime in your life. You know, somebody, you may have been, had a sickness to pronounce upon you and you felt dry. You felt in a place where you just was empty and you didn't know what to do. And you could run, but you couldn't hide. The doctor would tell, keep telling you the things, this thing and this and this and this. And it seemed like it got worse and worse and worse. But I'm telling you, the king comes looking for you. There, there'll come a time that the Lord will come and bring you out of that place. There'll come a time that the Lord will come and pick you up and take you to his house. Amen. I'm here to tell you this morning, it's time we understand that God cares about his people. He, as Linda said, you know, whenever we think about Calvary, if Jesus didn't love you, he wouldn't have went to Calvary. He, de- he didn't look, he didn't look and he didn't care where you was at it, because where you're at doesn't mean who you are. Amen. You can be in the lowest place in your life. You can be in the the bottom of society, but if you belong to God, He don't care where you've been because He belongs because you belong to God. Amen. And if you, Amen. If you've ever been introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ, He doesn't care. Amen. All He, he all He, all He cares about is that you hear His voice. My sheep hear my voice because you know because when He comes, He'll bring you into His house. What a homecoming when you realize that you're not lost no more. What a homecoming when you realize that if you breathe your last breath here to be absent from this. This body is to be present with the Lord. How, how important it is it to know that you know that you know that you know when you lay your head on your pillow tonight, if you wake up and you don't wake up here, that you'll wake up in the presence of God. You'll be sitting at the king's table forevermore. It's time that we realize that this is not a fairy tale. This is real. Amen, church. And we understand that God loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son. He He sent, he, he came looking for me. You know the thing, I, and I'm telling you, God is so good that he he don't care. He don't wait till you get good enough to get get him. He comes and gets you when you can't walk. He comes and gets you, amen, whenever, you, whenever you're sitting on a bar stool. He comes setting you when you're in a crack house. He don't care if you're in a whore house. He don't care because when he comes looking for you, he'll bring you out of a horrible place. He'll bring you to that place where he loves you. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Where you're at does not determine who you are. And I, we need to get that through. When we see somebody struggling when we see somebody and I've Lord show me that a long time ago sometimes we just need to realize that's some mama's little baby that's some mama's little girl that's some daddy's little boy and then they, they, they have a place in God's kingdom and they have, they have a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere it's time we understand I don't care where you've been Jesus don't care where you've been all that matters is that you make your eternal resting place in heaven when you because everybody is going to die one one day everybody's going to go somewhere it's either it's still either heaven or hell I don't care what they tell you it's that you can make the choice today it's heaven or hell and I promise you I choose heaven Amen. hallelujah give the Lord a shout You can be in that dry place. You can be beat up. You can be you can be skin alive if you would and everybody can be looking down their nose. God don't look down his nose. You know, the thing is, and Christian people won't forget where you come from. They still remind me where God brought me from. It ain't none of their business where God brought me from. Because he brought me from it. I'm not still in it. See, the thing is, and I thought this morning, when we was getting ready and we come to church, and I made a pineapple upside down cake yesterday. I left it sitting on the counter at the house. <laughs> so I told Linda, I said, we don't need that thing. I'm going to get it. Because I know what I'll do. I'll eat it. 
So, I was thinking, and I was, I was, was thinking about Preacher Jim and the way he preached. And if you all remember, used to, when he'd get to preach in that little church, how many remember a little church that didn't have air conditioning? He rolled his sleeves up, remember? Because why? It's hot. <laughs> it's hot up here. And the thing is, you know, and I thought about that, you know, and he wasn't popular with a lot of people because he still preached hell hot Amen. and heaven sweet. Amen. And he'd preach, you know, if Jesus, <laughs> if Jesus did a work in your life, you're not doing what you used to do. I'm not here to make you mad, but I'm here to tell the truth. The thing about it is, if you're, still, if you're still cussing every other breath and using the F word for a by word, if you're still getting drunk with your buddies, and you're, you're still going and doing all the things that you used to do, I'm wanting to know what you saved from. See, if you're still in it, you ain't from it. So you can stay, you can you can go to church and still live and load the bar. Yeah. So you can go to church and still live beneath what God has for you. But see, God's trying to call you out of that place. He's trying to bring you into a place, you know, where there's no shame no more. You know, the name of Mephibosheth means no more shame. See, the thing is, when God brings you out. Hallelujah, when God brings you out. See, he brings you out. He gives you a new, there's a new name written down in glory. Amen. He's not riding down drunk. He's not down, riding down crackhead. He's riding down a new name. Amen. When you, come, when you need to bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, when you give him your, your heart and your soul, and you're saying he gives you a new name, he, he opens up the book of life. Amen. He writes a new name in there. He calls, why? Because you're, a, you're the king's kid. He came looking for you. He brought you out of that place. He brought you into that place where you don't, you're, you're, there's no more shame. It's, you don't have to worry about He's going to restore unto you everything the palm of worm and the canker worm. He's going to restore back unto you the things that the devil's tried to steal from you. He's tried to take your life. He's tried to take your family. He's trying to take everything that you've ever worked for. He's trying to, he's trying to destroy you. And church, when we need to stand for the things of God. He's, the devil is trying to destroy our nation. He's trying to, he, our nation is under attack. But I promise you, God's people need to come, come back to the basics. They need to come back to the truth. They need to come back and set their, set their high down at the king's table. And they need to sit there and they need to understand that there's a way called straight. There is a way, amen. High, there's a highway called holiness and it'll lead you straight into the glory of God. We need to understand that this morning. More than we need to understand anything else. Because God's still calling. He's still looking for those that's a way off. He's still looking for those that's hiding in Lodabar. There's people that are still hiding. But I promise you this morning, God's trying to call you. Hear ye the hear the voice of God this morning. Quit hiding. He's come, he's come looking, he's come and look for you here this morning. He's come looking for you. He's come looking to you. He's gonna bring you out of that place. He's gonna say, man, he's gonna save you. He's gonna wash you. He's gonna cleanse you. But church, we need to come back. Let's come, we need to come back to the foundation. It may almost <laughs> makes my skin crawl when I hear people that go to church on Sunday morning. When I, when I see them post things on the, on the internet, and people show me, look what they're doing. They're posting, you know, sitting there drinking beer with their buddies, and, you know, there's nothing like this. <laughs> yeah, there are. There's plenty of them in hell. <laughs> but they don't see the thing is, is it's a social gathering. It's a social function. There's a social, it must be a social hell. No, they're not. But the thing is, you think about that, but see, there's no change. There's no conviction. Amen. Amen. Most churches don't even have Kleenex anymore because they don't want nobody to cry. <laughs> I promise you, you can't do nothing but cry happy tears. You need to cry sometime. Amen. Amen. Amen, and there's nothing wrong with it because I promise you, but whenever you realize, when you realize this morning, church, when you realize how much God loved you, 
When you realize that you didn't have to change anything for him to come to you. When you realize that he loved you enough that he'd come to you, he'll clean you up. I mean, he'll pick you up. Just like she was, uh, Linda was saying, you know, he's that father that'll pick you up. He'll bring you into his house. Amen, because that's home. Good Lord, amen. That's home, amen. He's bringing you home, amen. And he's going to keep you safe until he gets you home. That's how good God is. He's going to carry you. When you can't walk, he'll carry you. Amen. And you think about Mephibosheth, he couldn't walk on his own. He had to wait on somebody. But there's things in your life that you, can't have, you don't have no control over. It. But God has a way to make, a, make them work for you. Mephibosheth couldn't take care of his own stuff. Well, what did David do? He had appointed him helpers to make sure that he was taken care of. See, the thing is, you know, you know, the thing is, God cares about your job. He, he, wants you to, he wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That's in your Bible. So the thing is, if you, that job is a hindrance to you, God knows how to move you into another place. If that place is keeping you from living in victory, God knows how to open up a door and move you into that place where you can you receive the blessings of God. Why? Because He said, "You're not. Don't worry about. Don't worry about providing." He said, "You got a place at my table. You got a place at the King's table. There's food at the King's table. See, the thing is, in the kingdom." In a kingdom, how you, how you understood how good the king was is how good the people live. So if, you, if, the king, if the people were living in poverty, it meant he was a bad king. And the thing is, David wanted to make sure all of his people lived, lived good because God had been good to him. And we need to understand this morning, God wants us to live good. He doesn't, he doesn't, he said, David said this, I was young and now I'm old, I've never seen the, his seed, uh, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or the seed making bread. So the thing is, God knows how to give you bread. Yeah. Amen. So we need to see this thing, it's more you see the story. But it does, whenever you get, realize where you're, in that, where you're in that place, you've got to make a decision. You can, you can parallel this story with the story of the prodigal son. Some of us make bad choices in life. We knew better. You're just going to hell in a handbasket, and you knew better. But you get in it, and then, you're, you're, then you think you can't get out of it. That's a lie of the devil. See, the prodigal son, he, he came to his father. He said, Dad, I, I want what's mine, and I'm going to take it. I want it now, and I'm not going to wait till I get old. The Bible says he took it, and I didn't read this, but it's just come to me, so we'll just go with it. So the thing is, <laughs> and he took what he had, he took his inheritance, and he spent it on righteous living, unholy living. He went, he went out down to the local beer joint, he hung out with, with frivolous women, he done all that stuff, he was, he was sowing his wild oats. He was living life in the fast lane. All of a sudden, he had a wreck. <laughs> he woke up one morning, he was flat broke. All of his fair weather friends was gone. Because now he was busted. Now he's really disgusted. Because all those people that he'd been helping now, and he'd been spending all his money on, now they've gone, they're trying to find another free ride. Some of you been there. See, the thing is, but then the thing, and then he got down in the hog pen. Now, you know, if you know anything about the Bible, you know that it was, it was a curse for, for an Israelite to even mess with hogs. Let alone eat hog feed. So he, there, he down there, he's eating the slop. Then nobody, he's eating the leftovers. I'm church, it's time the church quits eating the leftovers. God has some good things for his people. God has a blessing in store for his people. And we need to realize that we're, we've been eating the slop of this world and God has something better for us. Amen. God has a blessing in store for us, but you can't get it while you live in the hog lot. 
But see, he's down there, Richard. You think about this. He's in there now. See, this is where people get. He gets in there. When you get in a situation, you think nobody's going to forgive me. The devil has a way of telling you, you've done this to yourself. Now it's left up to you to get you out. There ain't no need to go to your father's house. He ain't looking for you. You don't need to worry about him because you've done got what you're going to get from him. All the time, that father was looking every day for him. See, the devil don't want you to realize that the king's looking for you. That there's something good in store for you. The devil don't want you to realize that God loves you enough that he would pay the price for you. Amen. Why you was in the hog lot. See, when he was on the cross, amen, I was on his mind. When I was at Faith's beer joint, amen, I, when I was just hanging out at that, those places, God, I was still belong to God. See, the thing is, for he come to a place in his life he couldn't get no lower. No lower. Everybody turned their back on him. There was one man. Looking every day. Looking every day to see if his son was coming home. The Bible says in one day he came to himself. Came to himself. He said, my servants, my father's servants is living better than me. I don't even have a right to be called a son. I'll just go back to my father's house and say, Father, forgive me, but I, just, I, don't, I don't want anything. I just want to be a servant. When Mephibosheth, I got two things going here, but just stay with me. Don't get lost in the middle. Mephibosheth, the first thing he done is he fell prostrate before David. He said, I am your servant. So he humbled himself. So you're, you're not going to do anything for God until you humble yourself. You know, I'm humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he will exalt you. The thing is, we understand that that, 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 that young man, you know, he, he fell prostrate before King David, and David said, get up, she said, get up. There's no shame here. There's no shame in my house. I'm here to tell you, I, and I promise you, church, there's no shame in the house of God. True people of God don't care where you come from. That's all they're, they're interested in is where you get at the end. Amen. And the true people of God, there may be some that will look down your, their nose at you, but they better not let me see them. God still God, and he should save. He, he, he can save with the gutter most. I mean, he, he don't care what hog pen you've been in. I mean, he, he'll come to you, and he'll, he'll cause you to realize there's help in the Father's house. But that what prodigal son come back when his father, his word of God said, and the father saw him afar off, and he ran. Can you see that, Dad? He looked like hell. He was nasty. He was stinky. He was smelly. He was scarred. But through all that, his father saw who he was. That was his son. He saw him, and he ran to meet him. He didn't, he didn't say, well, whenever you get cleaned up, I'll hug you. And he ran, and he threw his arms around him, and he, and he, and he put a robe on him. And then he said, you, you're welcome home, son. You think about how good it must have made. And he said, Father, don't do anything for me. I just want to be a servant in your house. It's time we understand that God just wants us to be servants in his house. We're servants to the most high God. We need to give honor and due to reverence to the Lord Jesus Christ this morning because he died for us. And while we were stinking, smelling sinners, amen, he came to us. He ran to us and brought us out of Lodabar and brought us, amen, to the foot of Calvary. Now we're not, we're a king's kid and we're on our way to heaven. Ain't you, aren't you glad this morning, amen, that you're on your way to heaven this morning? Are you on your way to heaven? Or do you know that God is for you? So no matter where you're at, where you're at in life, you still belong to God. You're still a king's kid. Well, somebody invested in you a long time ago. 
he did on Calvary. That blood was shed for the vilest sinner. Even these people that create, do, do these heinous crimes, Jesus died for them. We can't understand it except sin magnified. And we see that going on in our world. But the church has got to come back. There's a heaven and a hell. I, you know, I get so tired of this. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, but that does not give us a license to continue in sin. Paul said it like this, it said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. But if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father who's making an intercession for us. We won't continue in the sin. We'll ask for repent. We'll ask God to forgive us in our sin, and we'll come out of that sin. Somebody else say amen. amen. See, a lot of people want to live, continue living in sin. I've got my ticket punch. <laughs> well, there's three or four places in the Bible that tells you there won't be no drunkards entering into the kingdom of heaven. No whoremonger, no fornicator. No adulterer. I didn't write it. See, yeah, I just read it. And the thing is, God separated, he separates you. And once you come into the knowledge of Jesus Christ, church, you may fall, and you may scuff, you may scuff up both your knees, but God will pick you up. And if you won't run from him, he'll help you, help you through it. Instead of running from God, we need to run to God. Yeah. Amen, because he's, he's not there to kill you. Because right now, there's, he's, there's mercy. Amen, there's plenty of mercy to go around. I thank God for mercy. Because, amen, whenever I, when I come short, I can ask God for mercy. Amen, because I am living under grace. And I am empowered by grace. Because it is, it's, it's, it is like Linda said, it is more than amazing. Whenever you think of the grace of God. Mephibosheth. Couldn't really, he couldn't really fathom in his mind that somebody cared about him. See, that's the whole thing. You'll find people right now in life that they, it's hard for them to believe that somebody actually cares about them. Doesn't they don't they don't just just a, a kind word? Word of God says a kind word turns away wrath. Whenever with a kind word to somebody that's Richard asked prayer the other night for a, young, a man's grandson, just a young boy, thinking about committing suicide, killing himself because he just don't feel like there's no worth. It's a tactic of the devil to kill our young people. Yeah. We need to understand that, church. We need to understand that they need to know that they're worth something. That's amen. That there, 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 there's plenty of God there to go around, and we need to re, we need to shed that. God sees where you're at, and God understands where you're at. And this morning, I'd, I'd ask you: Is the Jesus Christ really Lord of your life? Is He really Lord of your life? Has He? Have you given Him? control of your life. So Lord, I'll follow you. Following Jesus is probably one of the easiest things I've ever done. Because my Bible says he's not a hard taskmaster. It's serving the devil that makes you feel like junk of the morning. See, whenever you can't tell me. See, I'm, I'm from the old school. I understand. When you have to ask somebody if you had a good time last night, did you really have a good time? That's true, thing, Brother Tim. Been there, done that. Or maybe wake up in the morning and wonder how you got home.
Who brought me home? Get up in the morning, your car's not in the driveway. Hello. <laughs> but see, I knew, this, I knew that if I died, I'd go to hell. Because of that old time preaching. See, they would, you know, preachers like Preacher Lee would scare the hell out of you. Every Sunday. And it worked a lot. Because you could be drunker than a coop. Lay your head on the pillow and you'd be saying, Lord, don't let me die. I won't ever do it again. Line, line, line. Anybody beside me ever laid, your, laid down in the bed and laid one foot out on the floor so the bed would be still so you could go to sleep? Come on now, I'll tell the truth. See, some of you, see, tell the truth. Just long enough to get the bed still so you can just pass on out. Because if you didn't, you're going to throw up in the floor. But all the time laying there in that drunken stupor, I knew I was bound for hell. Got quiet in this Presbyterian church. People don't want to hear that no more. But see, the thing is, people are living in Lodabar, and they don't want to come out. They're living in that place. They don't feel like they can get out. If I hear one more phony preacher, tell me, if you ever do meth, you'll never get off of it. I'm going to hit him in the mouth, and all you'll come see me in jail. <laughs> so I will ask you this morning, if you've ever done meth, I don't want to embarrass you, but I want, you to, I want to show you that the delivering power of God works. If you've ever done meth, and, you, and, you try, and God delivered you from it, I want you to stand to your feet. My Bible. Glory. See, you may have camped out in Lodabar for a while, but God brought you into the king's table. Now you're eating at the king's table. Now you're eating from the place that God has for you. There's something better for you, amen, and God's worthy because my Bible says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I promise you, church, I promise you, we can believe God and they don't have to go to NAA, AAA, or any of them other A's. They just go to J-E-S-U-S and he'll bring you out. See, the thing is, this is how good God is because, see, he don't want you to die in Lodabar because all the time you belong to him and he sent somebody looking for you. He sent a loudmouth preacher. He sent a praying mama. He sent a praying grandmama. He sent somebody by and you heard about Jesus and you bowed your knee and you gave your heart and your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. He delivered you and set you free. That's what I'm talking about because God didn't want you to die in your place that you had made rest in, he won't, he's going to re re relocate you. He's got the ghetto into the blessings of God. That's how good God is. Amen, that's how God, that's what God will do if you'll just trust him. Amen, God wants to bless you. Whoever, who would ever have thought that, that God could turn your life around? Because you're better than that. You're better than that. You belong to the Lord. He saw you in your place. He said, I'm going for them. I'm going to get them out. I'm bringing them out. Richard, get some. This morning, you think about it. These guys get ready to come to the platform. Are you living in the wrong place? Are you living beneath what God has for you? Are you living in that dry place? Are you living in that barren place?
Jason Crabb sang a song. He came, he came looking for me. See, the thing, I, I, you know, I hear people say this all the time, you know. I found the Lord. He wasn't lost. You was. He came looking for me. I was lost. And he came and he found me. And he brought me out with a mighty arm and outstretched hand. He came. He brought me to that place where I could receive him as Lord and Savior of my life. I've been serving God since 1977. I hope to God if I live to be 100, I'm serving him when I turn 100. That'd be, a, that'd be a 2054. I hope to be serving God, preaching whatever he has, has me to do. But I want you to stand to your feet this morning. You've been sitting a while. If you're here, and Jesus ain't Lord of your life. If you're still struggling with situations, say, God, I just need a little help. I'm somewhere between Lodabar and the king's house. Thank you. He said, come. There's a table spread. I have a place at my table for you. Would you come this morning and bow your knee in this altar and ask God to set you free and help you? Would you do that this morning as they sing?
get ready to pray for our sister. You know, there's others here that don't want no, don't know Jesus. Come to this altar. He's here to help you. He's your help in the time of trouble. He's your strength when you've been knocked down. He's everything that you need. church. this you can run but you can't hide when God comes looking for you it's over amen just go ahead and surrender say God it's better to serve you than to run from you amen so we're gonna go next door and have dinner but I'm gonna ask the blessing why y'all are kind of quiet because I know how rowdy y'all are so and uh, I'm gonna ask the blessing over it so we, well, that way you move on. it's good to see Roger this morning I told your mom this morning I ain't seen you in the coon's age, so. And, uh, yeah. so. Amen. Amen. R- real quick for Pastor Carl Price. Um, if, a, if there's going to be small children going to be here, if an if a adult can accompany one of the small children, please, going through the line, there's not a problem with that. If that adult gri- grabs your plate at the same time, that's your payment for having to take that kid through the line. So that's okay. But also ask if... If uh, our, our elder men and women of our church, we would like for you to go before other people. I guess, what age would that be, Brother Carl? 90 and up. 90 and up. <laughs> so if you're 90 yeah. and up, you go through first. <laughs> if you're old and you feel like you're old, go through first. So that's, that's all I can say. So let's pray and ask God's blessing. We do enjoy it. We appreciate the ladies coming this morning and being a blessing. And we appreciate everybody being here. Just uh, if you don't have a home church, we'd like to welcome you to come. We'll, be, we'll treat you so many different ways. You've got to like one of them. So just come and be part of us. And uh, we'll, we'd love to have you come. So let's just pray and ask God's blessing. Father, we come to you right now. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we're set, we can sit at the king's table. But Lord, we're getting ready to sit at a natural table, Lord, that people prepared food for and, Lord, we just ask, God, that you're blessing to be upon the people that prepared it. And, Lord, that you just allow us to have a time of fellowship and, and that maybe, Lord, reminisce some of the old times that we've had together, Lord, just good times. Lord, serving you together, Lord. We just ask, God, that you just be with us in a special way. Bless this food and bless it to the strength and nurse for our bodies. Our bodies always your service, Lord, that we can please you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go through that way and they'll get food ready in a few minutes.